Hi, I'm Mark Buckley, and this is Inside Ideas, my 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine podcast. And I, I think that's one of my great wishes. If, if, I, if someone asked me, you know, what would you highly recommend to someone who's 17, 18, I would say take a year and go backpack around the world because you're going to come back and you're going to look at your life completely differently and probably every bit is equally important. You're going to look at the rest of the world differently. And it's very hard to have an us versus them perspective in life when you've actually spent time with the them. And, and that applies whether it's people of a different ethnicity, people of a different culture, people of a different geography. Because um, the other thing you realize when you travel so much around the world, as I'm sure you know, just, you know, parents care about raising their kids and, and giving them love and, and giving them opportunities. No matter where you go around the world, you see these commonalities that are so much bigger than the small differences that sort of become these reasons for why we should dislike each other. What the word Zootopia actually means. Please do, yes. Um, it means food place, and it comes from the Greek word sitos for food and topos for place. And I invented this word as a practical food based alternative to utopia. That's why I went Greek. Um, and the reason I did that was because utopia, I discovered when I was researching it for Hungry City, it's a joke word. It can either mean a good place or no place. So it comes from the Greek OU, which means good, or EU, which means no. Yeah. And I remember finding this really depressing because utopianism, if you like, is our greatest tradition of thinking in a joined up way about how, how, we, how we can live well, you know, how we can lead good lives. And to discover that this place is good, but it doesn't exist, uh, really, really upset me. Um, and by then I'd been kind of researching Hungry City, I guess, for about seven years. So i would realized by that point that, oh, you know, actually everything is shaped by food. So maybe, you know, I can invent a word that means food place and then we can actually, we already live in it. So it does exist. It very much does exist. Um, and so I rang up some friends of mine who, you know, they're very, very leading thinkers in the sort of, in the ancient Greek world, as it were. Um, you know, they, they are alive. Uh, in the <laughs> world. And I just said, you know, if you're an ancient Greek and you wanted a word that meant food place, what would it be? And, and they said, you know, they gave me this word sitopia because sitos was the Greek word for bread. So there's many Greek words for food, but it's the fundamental, the thing without which you can't live. Um, so it actually really should be sitopia, but they said, well, no Greek would have been crazy enough to make a word up that sounded that daft. So just make it sitopia, which is what I did. But I like finding really eye-catching stories that are quite extreme, but in the analysis of them, we can all learn something, even if we're not living extreme lives or at the cutting edge of anything. So I, I, I'm drawn to really kind of big, uh, incredible stand, sounding stories that when you look at, at the meat of them you realize that um, you know we can all learn something from them so and I, and I like the gray area in things I don't like things where there is there is one answer uh, I like the mess of, of looking into things and quite often you start looking at something and you think you're going to arrive at one conclusion and you realize that actually that is that is so the, the sort of the least interesting thing about it so I like charting the journey of investigating something and seeing um, how you arrive at somewhere that you didn't necessarily think that you were going to arrive at and I think we live in a world where um, everything is very polarized and very binary and very black and white you're either one of these people or another one of these people and I, I've never I wish I could fit into one of those camps it would be really life would be really easy if I was just you know that kind of person you know the, the vegetarian person or the right-wing person or the feminist person or the environmentalist person I've never been like that I've always picked causes according to their individual merits and not how they fit in with my identity and um, you know that's why I was I was a foreign correspondent for many years and I worked on um, this this television program for, for nearly six years making documentaries from around the world and part of the reason why I did that is if you're a foreign correspondent it means you don't have to specialize you can be interested in science and politics and uh, you know you can be interested in stories about women or stories about technology or anything it just has to be not in your own country so that's where the human beast origins come from and really with the whole thing our objective is that and we mean it, yeah? So what's actually in the introduction of the human beast, I do, do say this, but we, we mean it, yeah? It's one of those times, yeah? Well, the introduction actually is the real thing, is that we have, we as a species, yeah? We have messed up the planet. We, we are, that there's, in the history of life, 4.2 billion years, there's never been any other time when a single species messed up the planet, yeah? And we did it. And then it seems that the speed at which the, the virus is collapsing is at least a thousand times faster compared to the speed of the next fastest collapse. Yes. This is the sixth, sixth collapse of the biosphere, sixth, sixth extinction event. So like, if you imagine that a toddler is walking to, towards you the end of a park, yeah? That was the speed of the last extinction event of the planet. Now, instead of that, there's a jet fighter flying full speed at you, yeah? So that's the crisis we are having in our hands. And there's no other way to solve this other than our species gets itself together and takes responsibility and does it. I think it is going to be another golden age. And I think to your point, it's the companies that really understand that the way we had done things in the past is not the way forward. It's really about understanding holistically, thinking holistically. It's about systems thinking, systems design, and understanding that the planet is more, it's not just about humans. You know, it's about the whole planet. And I think that's the opportunity. 
if you listen to this podcast and see the video, I think Mark and I, we touch upon some amazing um, journeys, if you will, from um, stories around the world, whether we are going to Uganda, to New York, uh, where we're happening in, in Europe, where we live both, we live we're both in the same city, we have similar thoughts, but I really learned a lot uh, in, from your inspiring questions and uh, from, I wish the listeners have the time to spend to, you know, engage and see their potential and think a little bit more like moonshots and learn about butterflies and how a metamorphosis of our world can basically lift us all up. I feel myself as a global citizen because I, I always feel that when you grow up from a nomadic community, you, you, you don't feel yourself that you belong to one space in very locked land. No, you feel that you, you belong to the open space. You belong to all the peoples and you live in harmony with even fishermen, uh, farmers, you are pastoralist or someone who's going to the office. So you, you feel that, and this is the open spirit of growing up in a nomadic community. Let me tell you like a little history about me. Communicating with engaging with the public. Uh, but generally speaking, I just think that I'm a big believer in um, exploring creative ways to engage with the public. Like, as a scientist, I fully recognize that science is necessary but insufficient to fully engage with the public. Scientists need to be working with creative people, with artists, with the arts, and with technology. I think we really need to bring together art, technology, and science together. Uh, and uh, it's only when you um, take the lessons of science and the best practices from research, package them in creative, engaging ways with artists, but then use technology to deploy them at scale, that you can really shift the needle in meaningful ways. So General Magic, if for, for your listeners who haven't seen the movie, I'd highly recommend the documentary because it's a great story about how um, both the future is unevenly distributed and also about how, um, you know, the future comes very, very slowly and then all of a sudden. And people, you know, the, the example of General Magic is a good example of how, for instance, Apple um, was working on a vision that was very close to the iPhone as early as 1995. Um, and that every few years, it looked like it was just a couple years away. Many people created products. The company that I was a founder of, OmniSky, also created a product with this vision. Um, and then 2007, all of a sudden, the future arrives, but it, you know, it was incubating, it was uh, bubbling, I've got some bread rising in the kitchen. It was you know, doing that uh, uh, you know, incubation that all technologies do and then suddenly burst out. A companion is my favorite word. Uh, it breaks down the etymological origin of companions. Com is the Latin for with, and pan, of course, is the Latin for bread. Uh, a companion is somebody you share food with. And indeed, it is a universal human behavior that you can see in every country and every society all over the world that sharing food is a central uh, piece of making friends, of building community, of creating society. And we do that in both a very local and domestic level, sharing food with the people that we live and uh, live with and love, but also on a national and international level, the exchange of food has been a fundament, indeed is the underlying uh, thing that gives rise to civilization. The fact that you can have a farmer um, who produces enough food for more than just uh, their own family is what gives rise to civilization, because it means you can have some people doing things that are not just food production. I think that we're all holding two poles right right now and and they're the very ends of those spectrum one is in our field in particular when we're thinking about what the opportunity is here it is there's a tremendous opportunity there's a moment that we've all gotten still enough to see what's really happening in the world and on the flip of that there's this incredible amount of pain right in unknowing in death in in triage and the things that most people live their lives oblivious to right and so there's it's all on the table right now and i feel like as a long-term organizer and advocate um usually you feel like you're holding up a wall and right now it feels like the wall has disappeared and everybody's kind of just looking at us, being like, okay, what's next? Regardless of climate change, helping people to understand how to stay in control of their emotional mind, not, not, not dismiss it, but stay in control of it, allow it to happen, but understand it and be in control of it. And then let your rational thinking and your actions be guided by your intellect and your rational mind. And that's kind of the, that's a, been a big journey for me throughout my career, really. But obviously it's really come to a fore in the last few years while I've been really thinking about it myself um, and it's it's a fascinating field of of research that I, I know a lot of people psychologists in particular um, delve into and uh, and that is a challenge that if we can get that across to more people and I think it'll help us with the communication process I think the world needs a different slant and I want to be part of that game uh, and that is a more human a more um, I'd say a collaborative and open uh, and welcoming way of uh, working together and, uh, and and sort of acknowledging that body mind and spirit need to be formed together particularly in the world of work. 
So that and it sort of made me then step out of uh, where I was and uh, for me to then create what today is called soul works, basically in the name itself, bringing together soul and works and having that harmonize um, in a far more, I think, impactful way if we bring these worlds together. I wrote a book about the future I want to imagine and want to contribute towards. And um, the reason for that was to, to clarify for myself, primarily, whether we can, we can achieve this. This being 10 billion people living on the planet, in balance with the planet, and equally wealthy on all five levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And yes, I absolutely know that this is doable. I feel that Mark is honest. Like I feel you're honest and your honesty deserves my opening up a little bit more. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about the Juicero thesis because most people, right? And I, I'm defining most as like 90%, not 51%. Most people never understood what happened to Juicero, why I did it and, and what happened. So I'm going to share with you succinctly. I'm born in Liechtenstein, country with 38,000 inhabitants. I think we have to rematch and to tell stories to influence change. Liechtenstein is a good starting point to do so, because here you can think big and nothing is impossible. That's why we have started to tell stories that we could imagine, because everything you can imagine is real. And we felt that it was the moment to do something. That was the reason why we started the nonprofit foundation, the System Change Foundation, with the World Systemic Forum and the Hoos. The Hoos is, is a house, where, a happening hub, where we try to think different. We all know technology has to be part of the solution, but it is more than technology. We need as well behavior change and policy change. Systemic change needs creative ideas and the willingness to reimagine. With our approach, with our world systemic forum and the who's, we help to reimagine. We bring together opinion leaders, decision makers, creative minds, capital, what you need to reimagine. Imagination is the starting point of everything. We're living at extremely complicated times. There are all these vectors coming together, climate change, social change, geopolitical change, and COVID has just highlighted some of the intense um, weaknesses in many of our global systems. In order for us to build a better future, we all are going to need to come together in new ways and radically collaborate. My new company, BOMA, is a company that educates all stakeholders on how we can build a better future. So please join me to hear more. I live my life uh, with the philosophy or with the belief of three M's, okay? No matter the future will come, I will live my life with moderation, which means the, the wisdom of balancing between me, myself, and other life. The second M is uh, mindful, okay? I, I, before I make any decision, I have to think through. I have to be conscious about the, the impact, about the, the karma, that's why in addition to my talk on the sufficiency economy, I always have a talk on the karma marketing because uh, there's something that can either create a positive footprint or positive footprint. Karma is a footprint, right? So I always mindful. I always think about if I do this, what's going to be uh, the impact, not just the outcome, what's going to be the impact of my action. And the last one, whatever I do, I have to make sure that it's meaningful. Because uh, if there is no use, if they cannot be uh, beneficial to our life, it's just the action. Questioning and following the evidence is the pathway to the future. That is how we've gotten as far as we have as, as a species, and it's a good thing. And asking deep questions is, is, is valuable. And um, the other thing I would say is, you know, as, as, as I said earlier, the divisions between groups of people that seem really important are artificial and minute compared to what we share. And if we have the perspective of, of the pale blue dot of, of zooming out, we can realize that we are all in it together. And we're so, so, so astonishingly similar that if anyone came from the outside, they would not be able to detect the differences that we seem to think are very important. It's, it's a world where there are two caves. In one cave, it's people living is conscious, people living clean, people who is worried and concerned about others, about nature, the environment they live in. The other cave, it's people dirty, they don't care about others. When they have to go to the toilet, they even don't go out of the cave. So when everything is a mess, they decide to move to another cave. Now, the moment, the current moment we are living, there are no more caves to move. So we have to change our mind and care the cave, the place, the environment where we live. So we must change the mind, the mentality, 
there is no more me and you. Now it's time for us. At the moment, we are just like single intelligence units. And there are maybe some AI intelligence separately. But, but when we connect this intelligence on a global scale and we, we learn how to better connect our brains together, and th then it will be such an exponential growth of intelligence. I envision a time where we're going to have domes on the moon, where people are going to be able to go and pick up their crops as a layover flight to then go to Mars. I truly see this as the future. Imagine Mars having biospheres made of something known as silica aerogel that was made by Harvard scientists and NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory scientists. And it's this cloudy material that was originally used to be the insulator for spacecraft. But it's not too far-fetched to have it be domes on Mars to grow crops. And MOXIE, an instrument on the latest Mars rover, the Perseverance rover, is a material, is an instrument that can convert carbon dioxide into oxygen. And it's going to be able to do that on Mars. So who knows, maybe within the next five to 10 years, the robots that are already living on Mars will be able to start building these habitable locations for humans to be able to visit. There are no borders. It doesn't matter where CO2 emissions occur. It really doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter if one country is performing better than another, if one economy is performing better than another. This is a global problem, a global challenge. And the only way to solve this can be a global way. And creativity is a critical part of solving the, the mess that we find ourselves in right now. It's, you know, I have kind of a thesis that the business world stole the word creativity and repackaged it as innovation because it's more fundable. And yet as all these different uh, music classes and arts classes are being cut. Like we're, we're going to like lose creativity. And if we lose creativity, there's no more new ideas. We're stuck with everything that's already in a textbook and there's no more progress. There's no more uh, solving of the problems that we've found ourselves in, which requires creative thinking. What pirates did and where, it, where they, I think, are, are good is that you can use a pirate ship as a kind of a microcosm of how we should exist together because you just like, we're on a ship in the middle of the ocean. We've got to survive. We've got enemies all around us. No pl safe place to harbor because we're now enemies of the state. And um, we have to exist together. We have to exist in, in some kind of harmony. And how are we going to do that? And that's that urgency um, that they had is really useful to put yourself in that scenario. Um, perhaps we haven't felt that urgency until now and say, okay, what are the principles here? Um, and the things that emerge, well, you know, we all have to be heard. We have to, we all have to have a, um, and, and I guess one of the facts I love about how pirates made decisions was when they decided the articles in the pirate code, they had to be unanimous vote. There was not even if one person disagreed with one of the, one of the articles, it didn't go in because that was that slight 1% risk of mutiny was not worth it. So, um, you know, it was real, real unanimous decision making, completely different to the kind of government lawmaking that we have now where it's imposed upon people. If anything, then history has shown us that in any crisis, whether that's the financial crash in 2008 or the dot-com crash, you know, 1999, 2000, that companies that kept investing in culture and innovation and actually made big leaps, you know, Google, to name one company that famously rose and emerged from the dot-com crash more resilient and was stronger than before because it kept investing in, in new products and Apple did as well. So I think there's something to be said from an economic, from a business perspective, not to just completely go back to this reductionist view and be super pragmatically focused on the bottom line, but actually no, continue with a much broader view of business. Um, but I think there's a real tension now and there's gonna be a real struggle. Um, so some of those um, fundamental um, market forces that are gonna be, I think, reinforced and they're gonna uh, see new support. And for a more humanist way of doing business uh, in, in the spirit of, for example, the, the CEO roundtable statement that came out last year and many companies changing their mission statements and changing the way they operate. Um, it's, I think they, they have to stick with their, uh, stick with their path. So uh, it's either a back to the basics or it's a real, it's a license to reinvent business from the ground up, which I hope is, is the path that we'll take. You've used the word actionable. Yeah. And that's, that's a favorite word of mine. Uh, it's a favorite word in my, in my research group. Um, I love doing science. I'm fascinated by science. I've been fascinated by science since, you know, since I was five years old. But I think scientists have a, an ethical responsibility to make sure that their science makes a difference in the world. And, and that's no, nowhere is that more true than environmental science. Scientists and policymakers have to be clearer about the consequences of deforestation and the consequences of another epidemic. But similarly, scientists have to think more like businessmen and say, can we come up with solutions for this that people can invest in so as the solution stops the bad thing happening, but does so in a way that generates job and income for people who are prepared to invest in it. And that requires more interactions between 
ecologists, which you know, won't be not in with environmentalists, and economists, uh, and perhaps also with sort of business people and entrepreneurs to sort of say, how can we develop economic models that are cr going to create huge incentives for doing sensible things rather than corrupting incentives for doing bad things? I believe that the part that governments have to play, right? The governments have to make sure that the pandemic doesn't spread exponentially in the country, um, which you can achieve by enforcing social distancing and mask wearing and, and uh, doing enough testing. Um, but of course, that's not very nice for economy, right? The real question on the uh, side of economy and probably on the side of all of our social lives, because people have our social animals and we want to go out and meet them. I enjoy seeing you on Zoom much a lot, right? But I enjoyed speaking to you directly in at DLD much more. So um, we want to get back to that. And I think that's a question that at least we're still working on. How can we use technology um, to maybe need less measures and still prevent exponential threat spread. So we understood that in the end, we are going to build a food system of our own. So I mean, as, as we move forward, we're always being compared to the meat industry, but in the end, we're going to be an independent uh, food system of our own and we're going to have our own footprint. And we, uh, we, from the core of this company was how we take this and build a sustainable and resilient food system. So the way we look at sustainability, is we build it under four pillars of sustainability. Uh, the first is, of course, environmental. This is a, a major uh, aspect in sustainability. A lot of times it's almost, almost sometimes associated a, a almost completely only to environment, which I disagree to, but, but it is a very important aspect. Um, and we have declared that, so we call our uh, manufacturing facilities biofarms. This is how we, we call them. So our biofarms are gonna be carbon neutral by 2025 and our whole full supply chain is gonna be carbon neutral by 2030. But we're not stopping on the carbon neutrality. It's, it's a very important aspect. But we want to also, we're building strategies regarding our water, uh, land use, uh, waste, uh, recyclability, circular production. I mean, so we have a very, uh, I would say, elaborated strategy regarding the environment. You know, when I was studying sustainability management at Columbia, what I learned really quickly was that there was this idea when I entered that sustainability was kind of a destination. Oh, we've arrived. We're sustainable now. And it's just, it's total bull. It's, it's not. I mean, sustainability is a process, right? So, so it's not like, oh, this city is sustainable now, or this building is sustainable now. No, because you attempt something. You make a lead platinum building, and then you observe, and you learn, and you increase the standard again to go further, right? You want to go from carbon neutral to carbon negative, you know? And, and so that journey is what people need to remember very often. I think in Vertical Farm, people have missed that. They, they just kind of see it as like, oh, we've arrived, and this is it. It's constant improvement. And it, because it's improvement, that means that the method matters almost more than the kind of like final result. You have to have the method. And that's what I've tried to focus my practice on is, you know, what are the steps to ask the right questions and observe and focus your improvement on to, to get that process of sustainability constantly going? Really, it's about change, about how do you affect change? And I think that in order to do that, I, I would recommend getting a really good understanding of um, how, you know, societies form and, you know, like understand some sociology, understand something about economics. Um, and, and obviously philosophy as well. But you know, that sounds pretty dry, I guess, if you know, to a gentleman as well, really. But, but you know, it wasn't until I started looking at those things that I began to understand you know, how this all works, how it fits together. Because I think that this, you know, you really, I think it really, it's important to understand what, system, what we mean by a system and what we mean by structure and structural change and structural reform. And until, I think until you get to grips with that, you end up going down lots of, of um, you know, blind alley. If we in Europe would do, as an example, two things, make it criminal to throw food away, <laughs> like the French model, perfect. Because then less than, uh, around 50% of what we produce goes into the, into the bin, into rubbish. Yeah, because either the currents are not beautiful enough <laughs> or we mismanage the logistics. So if we make it criminal to throw it away, there's no shortage of food supply. It's a question of management or appreciating carrots which have small issues which you might have to cut off. So there's no shortage of food, number one. Number two, if we as society change the way how we look at children, and the upbringing of children. So what we have right now is what I call the civil war at home. Yeah, we know like in Luxembourg, 90% of marriages end up in divorce. They have enough money to pay family lawyers. So we know that when, when we know romantic relationships are not always working a lifetime and that's okay. What we as society do right now, we then celebrate people who create a war at home. Yeah, so custody battles, access to children, parental alienation, et cetera, et cetera. So this, there's a reason why the guys we meet at, at the Cairo Summit or H Farm, why they have one or two burnouts in their early 20s? Because they grew up in a civil war at home. Yep. Yeah? So if we stop that, if we have the food situation making it criminal, second, a society say, you know what, if you don't provide equal access to the child to both parents, then you are actually wrong. We don't want to know the rest. Yeah? If there is no, if there's no uh, security or safety issue, then children should have equal rights to be with both sides of the family. If we establish that as a status quo, things will change in no time. I realized that there were solutions happening on the ground. There were new business models that were not only making a profit, but also 
positively contributing to uh, the health of the planet and um, the well-being of people. Um, and, and that's how sort of my commitment to, to climate change uh, um, uh, started, really through the realization that, that the climate change challenge touches on most of the other global challenge that we're facing. So we need to secure the future of terror and humanity. And I suggest a new concept for this, a new term, which I call futurity, futurity, because this future of terror and humanity is something every reasonable person should be able to agree on. And the, the, the advantage of this concept would be that we can distinguish between that which is sustainable and that which is kind of the overall goal, the vision. Because if we use the same word sustainable for the apple we buy, and for the great vision for humanity, we risk that the great vision gets damaged if we realize the apple is not as sustainable as we thought. And this happens actually quite often that we think things are sustainable. And then a few years, few decades later, we realize, well, it might not have been the best idea. Take, for instance, bioenergy. 15 years ago, we thought that uh, the, the energetic use of biomass is a good, th good thing to do. We, today, we have a totally different perception on that. You know? And that is an illustration. If people now say, well, scientists said 15 years ago, this is sustainable. Now they say it's not sustainable. Well, then sustainability cannot work anyhow. And I, and, and I think kind of uh, um, yeah, an, an, an airbag against this solution is to have a concept that we agree on. We need to secure the future of terror and humanity. We need futurity. And if we do that, we can argue about the details. You have to live on your own and independent. If you are waiting for the, the forward vaccine, you don't know when and you, you don't know how effect, effective that will it come to your body but if you if you are uh, use your body that if you do your body to be healthy and strong whatever the disease go to you then you can fight it by yourself not waiting for but vaccine medicine, or medicine yeah. if you have the, the best medicine but you don't have good digestive system or you don't have a good food or you don't have don't have good food body then you cannot get the putting from the, that best medicine, it won't work if you are not ready for them. To have a strong opinion on the future and have in mind that, you know, climate change is real. So it's not like that we have much of a chance that we can just experiment and like, yeah, let's see what 2035 brings us. No, I mean, this future has to be sustainable. It has to be, you know, the Keta generation, it has to be adopted by Gen Z. And then have a very educated guess like, okay, this is what I want to grow up to and then work backwards. And like, if, if that means my future as a company or as an individual, I can do that next year, next month, tomorrow to go at least the first step into that direction. You matter. No matter who you are, where you are, what you've done, you matter. Every decision you make, every breath you take, everything you do, you matter. So if you want to be part of creating the world we want to see, just think about what you're doing and and understand that that decision to buy the you know seventh generation unbleached toilet paper matters and i think we need we you and i mark yeah. and people like us need to work harder to get consumers to understand everyone is a consumer to understand that everything you do is important or start small and big but take opportunities and if there aren't any make them for example I always wanted to go to the Innovation Summit, and usually there was no chance of me getting in, because I was just a giant. But if you take up that opportunity, you can go. If there's no opportunities, join a group that can make you get more opportunities and get them and make them. For example, I taught them how to make posters for helping children during this morally struggling time. And we did it. People benefited. If you don't have any opportunities, just make them. Nutrition is going to be the organizing principle for the food system. And prior to this, for the last, you know, sort of hundred years, as the kind of the legacy system was being developed, it was all about calories and securing calories. I think now it really is securing, you know, sort of nutrition. Now that has profound, you know, implications on how you, um, you know, how you transition to that, you know, kind of system. You have to start thinking about things much differently. Okay. What we really are is one global civilization connected through infrastructure and supply chains. And just because you didn't make your t-shirt uh, that you're wearing right now, 
you know, you are part of the supply chain by which that cotton was farmed somewhere, water was used to treat it, it was the electricity was used in a factory, human labor went into it, and then it was shipped, uh, you know, on, a, on some, uh, you know, cargo vessel across the oceans to come back to you. So you are part of that footprint of that t-shirt. And the same goes for the manufacturing of, uh, of you know, um, any kind of, you know, mobile phone. You often hear the saying within luck, if I'm lucky, if I say I'm lucky, and people that are being polite to me say, well, Simon, you know, you worked hard. And then the people throw out quotes like, the harder you work, the luckier you get. You know, it's not true. The harder you work, the luckier you get is an Instagram quote that is not true. And I see it thrown around all the time. And I know plenty of people that have worked themselves to the bone, end up mental health issues, physical issues. You know, working hard does not equal success. Many, many, many people have proved this. Yet it's still the saying thrown around as if that's going to fix all your problems working hard. I was more successful when I worked less hard. Really smart people think they know the answer and they never do. They always get it wrong. And they think that the people who have the problem are just dumb. <laughs> They're not. So the issue is what's the real problem, right? And finding that is hard to do. So there's a number, you have to ask yourself a lot of questions. You have to walk down a lot of dead, dead ends. So you have to give yourself a lot of room for the first letter in our, in our little pseudonym, uh, create, which is to clarify. We need to be more creative and critical about what we're, how we're currently living and asking better questions of how do we change it. We need to be capturing people's minds and hearts in a whole different, you know, in so many different ways, whether it is through movies, whether it is through, you know, artworks. We need to be drawing in the science, the complexity of what the science is telling us, but then translating that into something that gets people at their heart to look at a beautiful artwork or a photograph of a, of a forest and go, wow, like that is worth saving. That is, you know, wondrous. That is magical. Um, that is putting oxygen into the atmosphere and that is capturing carbon that we so mistakenly put up there, but we know how it's related now and we know what we can do about it. Have the guts to be yourself. Or even as I hear the saying right here, be yourself. Everyone else is already taken by, by Oscar Wilde. Coincidence, okay? Um, no, it's true. It's like, have guts to be yourself. And if you don't know who you are, besides playing a role, find out who you really are. I, I think uh, you have to be hopeful. Um, and that if you apply positive thinking to your life, uh, and the, the, the idea of living more sustainably, you'll find that there are now lots of ways of doing that. Um, maybe more in developed countries as far as technology is concerned, but in developing countries often uh, they already are doing that uh, in the poorest communities. Uh, Hindu is a good example of, uh, of how she's living her life. Uh, so I think my attitude is always be positive, always believe that you can, uh, you can change things yourself. The children really are, are the future, so I really do believe in empowering the younger generation because they are the ones who are going to make a difference. I might, I might already be too late to make a big impact, but the impact they will make, that's crucial, especially at the stage that we are right now, where we have, if you look at the statistics of um, how the climate is changing, the children are the future, and they, they are the crucial, crucial turning point uh, within all of this, yeah. I've actually studied how big societal transformation happens. Um, and when, in order to have big, transitions. Um, it, the theory is, the academic theory is that you need disruptions and disruptions at multiple levels. So you need the status quo to be disrupted, which is where we are right now, I think, because of the pandemic, as well as some other factors. But our day-to-day -day normal, right, has been definitely disrupted. And I think everyone can feel that. Um, then you need some macro level disruptions. Um, that could be the climate crisis, um, right? We're seeing more frequent and intense climate disruptions of all kinds and, and, and the implications of that. And then at the same time, you need local level, innovative, niche experimentation, a grassroots activism. Um, and I see that as well. So, um, you know, I, I am um, optimistic about a, a restructuring and a transformation of, of society. I know it may seem naive uh, given what's going on, um, but I think there are enough of us who are committed and passionate and creative and innovative, and we are networked and we can be increasingly networked with each other and support each other. We need to teach children now more than ever that they vote each and every day. They vote with their mouths. They vote with their forks. They vote with their wallets. They vote with their screen time. And it's very important to be uh, you know, judicious and understand that in all that we do. And that's the way we're going to reclaim the world for the better of all, instead of the, for the better of a few. I think how you are connected to nature. Um, how, get, how do you get your, your um, food? What are you eating? Are you eating beef? Are you eating uh, meat? 
Um, what kind, how often? Because that is all related to rainforest. We all know about that. Um, it's related to how we grow uh, food. And I think it is not waiting for politicians to change um, the rules. It is about us being aware that we should help to change the rules. And that is part of um, how often we use uh, planes in the future, uh, what we eat, where we go, uh, how we treat nature in our gardens, uh, how we um, eliminate nature for another area where we want to build housing or a autobahn or whatever is built and we should be much more conscious and i'm not saying we should and we will be able to avoid everything i'm not saying here in, in an aesthetic um, mission and that we should go back to nature no way um, it is about uh, being more conscious about it. we are now in a time which i call half time and half times we have throughout our lives we have it in politics we have it as a company we have it as people now what is the future is what you what uh, you what i do what each one of us does that all these little 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 mosaic stones will form the future and if we are strong enough if we if we tend to say i'm too too small i cannot move anything then nothing will happen and i'm not talking about big revolutions and and you know burning down uh, something but in our world we can we can do the best and we cannot change the systems the, the future will be the big picture is that uh, under the leadership of china emerging economies will gain importance we will have to adapt to a new competition we will have to adapt to uh, all the digitalization uh, in our working world we will we will have to deal with uh, uh, unpleasant and pleasant uh, consequences of the, these developments but at the end we are the creators of our world we we when I grew up, I was uh, fascinated by snow and um, like um, when you are, uh, take a ball into snow and you roll a ball, then if you start rolling it in only one direction, the ball becomes a wheel, but in the, in the middle you will find the ball, but it, it will grow really fast, uh, high, because it only rolls in one direction and it will become very good in rolling in one direction. But then when it, this com it, you use an analogy with your life um, and you roll always in one direction and you um, have changed or you took the wrong values, which you mostly do when you are young, um, then that wheel will fall and then you will need years to find that ball again to roll in all directions. And what I try to do is, I, I always was curious and that ball always rolled in all directions. And if you do that, you don't grow that fast, but you grow stable and you, you have a ball that can't fall. So whatever happens with you, you are still able to roll. Um, and, and, and that's some life philosophy that I uh, created for me 20 years or 25 years ago, because I'm a, a huge addict on snow and mountain sports. I lived in Switzerland for a while, but I think that is something that people forget because they all want to go and be a wheel and be fast and go and hyper-focused. But then you're gonna fall and the, the higher that wheel is the bigger your fall will be if you have never fallen before soil is the stomach of the plant yep the plants don't have an internalized stomach they have a, an external stomach and they spend 30 percent of their photosynthetic energy exuding sugary sap into the root zone which nourishes a symbiotic community of bacteria and fungi upon which their digestion depends it's exactly the same in the human stomach we we host a symbiotic community of bacteria upon which our digestion and our health depends. So when we look at the soil anew, we can imagine it as the collective stomach of all the plants on earth, digesting and feeding. And what a beautiful kind of metaphor that is. And uh, it, it just changes one's attitude towards the soil. I really think it's, we have a bright future. And because well, with Reformaten, our goal is to open all these like small, local, positive, amazing ecosystems around the world. I see like a map of the world and see like all these dots. And I just want everyone to be happy and not suffer because life can be so fun and beautiful and tasty. And I want everyone to explore that. You know, I, I draw a picture these days comparing the forces that work on human organization and forces that work on an aircraft the lift of human energy, the weight of bureaucracy, the thrust of purpose, and the drag of fear. And if we're going to get an organizational aircraft off the ground every day, we better create more human energy than bureaucracy and more purpose than fear. And that simple model has really resonated with a lot of people. But then I make it personal. And I say, look, when that pilot points the aircraft down the runway, gives it full throttle, and it hits takeoff speed, they make this very simple little move on the yoke. They pull it back just a little bit, creating an angle between the nose of the aircraft and the earth. And that simple angle is all that it takes to get your organizational aircraft off the ground. And the name that they use in aeronautical engineering is positive attitude. And this is available to all of us literally the second you hear it. You get to choose your own attitude. You get to choose what attitude you bring to life. And you can choose a positive attitude or a negative attitude. If you want to get the people around you off the ground, be that force that you want to see in the world. Be that positive force. It's your choice. For me, the biggest change that people can make, whether it's on a personal level, in a company, in an organization, in a city, is to shift classes, to change from, as I mentioned earlier, this compliance. We have to do this. We have to be less bad at it. 
and put on the glasses of opportunity. What can this bring us? How can it enrich my life to start biking more instead of always taking my car to start eating plant-based, etc. Uh, and you can do that on all levels.